Hello?
ஹலோ ஹலோ Is there somebody Is there anybody What am here? I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Son. They're supposed to have a host on but we're not Do I just wait? Do I just wait? Anything happening? Nothing's happening over Nothing. here. That's actually a really good question. There's a host we keep being muted by the host. I I also can't join online. I don't know what's going on. I think there's one regulator Any access We can't hear you. Hello? 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 Aloha, Michelle. It's Rico. Nice to see you back. Now, if only your audio worked. 
we're trying to fix that. Oh, you're good now. You were just fine. It's common. We're just everyone's down. Can they see me? Because I got. Can I ask that all state officials please identify yourselves in your namespace? Mahalo. But hurting feet, making like stuff, it's Dr. Schultz time. Our couple too. He's your problem. Perhaps there's kind of tedious. It's just a strength. You're in. Okay, I'm going to try this again. Okay. Can I be heard? Hello. Hi. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, apologies for that. We had a more than one computer that was um, unmuted, so we were trying to figure out which one it was. Uh, I will go very quickly through introductions again, just because I don't know when we uh, lost connection. 
um, task force members that are, are participating remotely. Um, just a reminder that you must be visible. So you must turn your mirror on the TV down there. Okay. Okay, so task force members, you must have be visible. So you must um, have your video on. Um, and just a reminder that for the camera here, the angle has to be wide enough to be able to see all of the task force members on camera. Okay. So gonna go ahead and proceed really quickly. Um, Task force members include the department, a representative from the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, Ms. Dori Palkovich, who is an economic development specialist from the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, Ms. Joanne Uchida Takeuchi, Deputy Director uh, from the Department of Public Safety, Mr. Jared Radula, Chief Investigator for the Narcotics Enforcement Division, Department of Taxation, Director Isaac Choi, City and County of Honolulu, Dr. James Ireland, Director of the Honolulu Emergency Services Department, County of Hawaii, Mr. Barrett Otani, Executive Assistant to Mayor Roth, for County of Maui, Ms. Terry Lynn Gorman, was a member of Mayor Mike Victorino's communications team, uh, for the County of Hawaii, Ms. Ellen Ching, Administrator of Boards and Commissions. For the Hawaii State Senate, Senator Joy San Buenaventura, who is an appointee of Senator Ron, Ron Kochi, Senate President. For the House of Representatives, Representative Ryan Yamane, uh, who is the appointee of Representative Scott Psyche, Speaker of the House. For the Hawaii Cannabis Industry Association, Mr. Randy Gons, Executive Director, Patient Advocate, Nicholas Leverance, who is the Grants and Advancement Manager for the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center, Patient Advocate, Wendy Gibson Viviani, um, who is a, a nurse and a BSN. Um, we have an adult use legal scholar and proponent of adult use legalization, Mr. Garrett Halladier. Um, and I am Michelle Nakata, uh, the program manager for the Office of Medical Cannabis Control and Regulation with the Hawaii Department of Health. At this time, I would like to turn the meeting over to Mr. Andrew Goff um, to give us uh, some information about Sunshine Law requirements for this meeting. Okay, good morning, members of the task force. I don't know if you all can see me or hear me. Um, first, I would just like to say that everyone on the task force is uh, now a member of a government task force. And so sunshine laws do apply to you. I know that some of you are working government, some of you may not be familiar with sunshine laws and uh, exactly how they apply. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview, but I do, uh, suggest that you all go to OIP's website, the Office of Information Practices. There is a lot of information and guidance. Uh, and if at any point you have a question on what is acceptable, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I can answer that for you. Um, it's, it's important that you do that though and don't just uh, move forward if you have a question. Um, so generally, uh, a task force, uh, the task force business has to be done in an open meeting. So the task force business is uh, uh, identified by Act 169, which specifically says the task force is to explore the development of a dual system program of the legalization for cannabis and the impacts of legalization of cannabis on qualifying patients, including access to medical cannabis by qualifying patients. So that's a pretty broad, uh, authority there. Um, so anything that relates to that authority has to be done in an open meeting. And there are a few exceptions that I'm going to run through real quick. But generally what that means is a meeting has to be publicly noticed um, and everyone has to be open to the public. 
so uh, essentially the, the bottom line is you're not supposed to have phone calls, emails, uh, no polling, um, nothing uh, between the, the task force members unless it's an open meeting. And there are several exceptions I'm gonna talk about now. Um, they're called permitted interactions. The first is two members. Two members can discuss any board uh, uh, subject that they want at any point in time, only two members. This could be over phone or email, um, but there are two important things to remember. You cannot commit or seek a vote uh, regarding board business, and it can't be serial, which means you can't talk to one member, talk to another member about the same thing, talk to another member about the same thing, and eventually talk to all of the board members. Uh, the second is an investigation committee. My understanding is we will at some point probably set up an investigation committee with this task force. Um, there are some legal requirements you have to do to set that up, but basically at an open meeting, you will identify the scope of uh, an investigative, investigative committee. You'll identify the members of an investigative committee, and then that committee can go and do the investigation. They come back and give a presentation to the board at a second meeting. And then at a third meeting, the board can discuss and make an action on that uh, agenda item. Uh, it's important to know that uh, uh, an investigative committee can be less than a quorum. So that's a quorum here is eight people. It's a majority. There's 15 members of the task force. Um, so less than eight people can be on a, an investigative committee. Um, they can do an investigation however they see fit. Once they give the presentation, that is dissolved so they can no longer uh, interact with one another. They have to do it in an open meeting. Uh, the third permitted interaction would be at an event. Members, again, less than a quorum can attend an event that is uh, informational, so a conference or um, a community event that is uh, regarding information uh, about the board, uh, uh, business. Um, again, you cannot interact and curry a vote. So you can't ask a vote, you can't seek a vote. Um, the event can't be aimed at board members. So it has to be just a, an event that's already happening and board members can show up and uh, participate. Uh, they can only discuss board business at the event as it's related to the event. You can't go out to dinner afterwards and discuss and you have to report at the next open meeting who was there, what the event was, and what was discussed. And finally, if you lose quorum at a meeting, you can continue the meeting um, only to get testimony, public testimony, and you have to report again as soon as you get back to an open meeting. Now, the other one um, is you can have a closed meeting, and there are several things you can do in a closed meeting, but for this task force purposes. Really, the only one you'd be looking at is an executive session to communicate with your attorney on legal matters. So if any of you have legal questions during a board meeting, at any point in time, you can vote to go into executive session and discuss legal matters um, in a confidential manner. Um, and the only limit there is it has to be regarding a legal matter. You can't just vote to go in and talk about something else. Um, and then for the public notice aspect, all the meetings have to be public notice. It has to include an agenda that lists items that you will discuss. Every agenda item, um, so your, your discussions today and on, at every meeting will be limited to the agenda items. If it's not on the agenda, you cannot discuss it. Uh, you can add an agenda item, again, with a two-thirds vote, uh, but it has to be non-substantive, so basically, procedural things, little uh, administrative matters. So if it's not on the agenda today, you can't discuss it. Uh, if it does get brought up in public testimony or um, otherwise, you can note that you'll talk about it or put it on the agenda uh, for another meeting and talk about it then. Um, and then, uh, you know, finally, you have to allow public testimony on all the agenda items. And that's really what the agenda item is for to give public notice. So if anyone has any questions, again, you can feel free to email me 
personally, um, or if you need legal advice during a meeting, we can go into an executive session. I also want to entertain any questions right now. Any questions on what Andrew? Um, hi. Hello. Yes. Is that can you hear me? Under? Yes, we can. Is it a task force member? This is, yes, I am. This is yes, Carrie Lynn Gorman. I'm calling, Mayor, I'm calling from Mayor Victorino's office in uh, Wailuku, and I've been joining the Zoom meeting since 12 o'clock. My computer is just going round and round uh, since 12. It's now 1230. I'm only listening by phone right now. I'm going to try and hook up a video from another computer, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm having terrible technical problems over here. Andrew, is that any significance for us? Uh, I mean, so technically all of the uh, board should be visible, but I think you have a quorum, right? Uh, regardless, so right. okay, I would say try to get her online. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So keep working on that. Uh, but before Andrew goes back to his chair. He covered a lot in a, in a relatively quick period of time. Any questions for Andrew? That would be not going to move forward. Okay, see, now we're going to move forward. All right, uh, time for an important part of the, of the hearing, which is the public testimony. So, um, task force members, Teresa with the Department of Health, sent you 24 pieces of written testimony. You should have that. Uh, that was sent uh, this morning. Uh, now we're going to move into the uh, in-person telephone and Zoom, and let me read just a very quick preface. Oral testimony will be taken only during this agenda item. Testimony may address any topic on this item, on this agenda, but may not address topics outside of the listed agenda items. Excuse me. So testifying, testifying, Excuse me. Has to identify themselves and your organization if you are part of the organization. Excuse me, the audio is cutting in and out. I'm not sure if the person is near a microphone. Thank you. Due to the anticipated volume of testimony, oral testimony will be limited to two minutes per person. The Department of Health staff will keep the time and give notice of expire of the time. So we're now ready to move forward with any person participants. Uh, task members, uh, what we're going to do is you're going to, I'm going to entertain questions after each person testifies. All right. So uh, who's up first? Can we use that computer for testimony? If we need that one, we can probably use that one. Then people need to You're privating now. Okay, so who's up first? Who has the list? That's fine. Okay. Chair, I'm willing to go first. Uh, we're, we're taking in person first. Thank you. Then we'll move to telephone and then we'll move to Zoom. Thanks. Send it. Yeah. Jacqueline? No. So Dylan shop sign. Is that person here? Not here. I'm here. Going to pass. Going to pass. Okay, sir. Jacqueline Moore. Miss Moore, please. You need to hook up one. That's not working. Good morning. No. Thank you so much for the ability to testify. Um, on behalf of Big Island Grown, my name is Jacqueline Moore, CEO in Farm um, Farm D. I'm also a pharmacist. Uh, this is incredibly important uh, task force. Uh, what we are looking for is a responsible rollout of a dual use program, um, where it ultimately benefits uh, local residents and patients alike. Uh, please remember that. Patients may be self-medicated and not necessarily registered with the state currently. So when we start talking about dual use or an adult use program, please know that patients are still maybe accessing, uh, you know, dispensaries or uh, cannabis, uh, even through adult use 
out channels, even though they're not registered with the state. So uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to say today. And thank you so much. Ms. Moore, thank you. Before you leave, any questions for Ms. Moore, task force members? Seeing none, Ms. Moore, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Rossi. I'm here, I'll pass. All right, sir, thank you. Richard Eckert. I'm here, I'll pass. Thank you for right, time. Director, thank you. Luke Kim. Pass. Pass, all right. Uh, Cheryl, uh, I'm sorry, most most of them? What's the first name? Che. Che, you are. Sure. Sir, can you state your name and your organization? Aloha, my name is Che Mosman. Uh, I'm an independent cannabis consultant uh, based off the Big Island. Um, I have about 20 years experience in the cannabis industry, both traditional and uh, legal market. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for being here and uh, offer my resources for anybody that has any questions. That's it. Thank you. All right, so short and sweet. Thank you very uh, much. Any, before you go, you want to give the task force an opportunity. Any questions for Mr. Mosman based on what he's presented? Seeing that, so thanks very much. By the way, for those folks that have passed, I want you to know this is going to be your only opportunity to testify. This today. Today. Right. right. Okay, yeah. so you want to make sure that you understand it. All right. Thank you. Okay, Time. you're very welcome. Matthew Fiala. Oh, yeah, I got nothing. Okay, uh, Devon uh, Ward. Sorry, yes, sir. I apologize. It's hard for me to repeat some of these. Thanks for your understanding. Can you state your name? If you're part of an organization or organization. Yeah. Uh, aloha. My name is Devon Ward. I'm here representing the Marijuana Policy Project. Uh, for those, those that don't know, Marijuana Policy Project has been the leading organization uh, for cannabis reform for the past 25 years. Uh, we played a leading role in 11 of the 18 legalized states. Um, I'm an attorney by trade and I've been working with MPP for uh, almost three years um, and just wanted to offer uh, MPP's resources in terms of um, research, uh, whether it's on the issue of taxation, um, regulatory structure, um, personal possession limits, um, any issue really related to the facet of the legalization of cannabis. Uh, we, are, we are a resource and we already have a lot of that data compiled. Um, the other, uh, the other portion of my remarks, I, I, I really appreciate this task force meeting and pursuing this issue, but did want to um, really implore the task force to really uh, look at the issue of social equity, uh, which is a, a cornerstone of, of legalization, um, modern day legalization policy. Um, it's been implemented in, in many of the new legalization states, uh, and, and Hawaii really has a, a real opportunity um, to do social equity in a in a unique way that can uh, bring prosperity and uh, some restorative justice to the native Hawaiian community and the communities that have been most uh, affected by the fell war on drugs. And so really um, thank everybody for the opportunity to, to speak and the opportunity um, for this task force to meet. And um, if you have any questions, happy to, happy to answer them. Mr. Marshall, first of all, thanks for your very generous offer. And I want to assure you that we show social equity really well. Any questions for Mr. Morrison? Yes, sir. Um, yes, I have a question for Mr. Moore. Um, oh. Go in there. In brief, could you uh, look at or talk about a jurisdiction that has done, and I don't want to go into details, but what jurisdiction should we be looking for or a few jurisdictions we would be looking for as uh, a model for mm -hmm. social equity program? Certainly. Thank you for that question. Yeah, but um, you know, to, to be candid with the task force, no no state has gotten social equity completely right. Um, there are components of social equity programs in various states that have that have been successful. Um, what New York is doing is really interesting. Um, New York has has guaranteed fifty percent of the licenses go to folks who uh, have um, can, cannabis convictions. Um, New York is also using their administrative um, agency to uh, negotiate leases on behalf of those retailers. Uh, and they're also, uh, they've also allowed a one-time um, license for existing hemp growers to immediately enter into the adult use uh, cultivation market. Um, and so, you know, New York is really doing some really interesting things. Um, New Jersey as well. Connecticut, um, where, where, you know, I, I previously resided is, is put, a, put aside $50 million in bonding funding, funding specifically for equity applicants to access. Um, so there's a, a ton of good models out there. Um, but no state has gotten it 100% right. And so that's why I said Hawaii has a, has a really opp real opportunity um, to be a leader uh, in the social equity space. 
to follow up. Uh, I don't think this is working, so I have a loud voice. Um, with, with respect to participation of those with prior drug convictions, which, which if any jurisdictions are, are leading to that? Sure. Um, New, New York is one that comes to mind. It's, it's not in New Jersey's bill. It's not in Connecticut's bill. Um, it's not in New York's bill. Um, and it, and the, the concept of social equity as a policy feature in adult use markets or, or cannabis markets um, is really a new feature. So it was not around when Colorado legalized back in 2012, Oregon or Washington. They, they all developed social equity programs after um, their market went live. Um, but with respect to giving uh, market advantages to folks with uh, prior okay. convictions. I, I, yeah. I think New York is the only state uh, as currently that's that's doing that. Um, Task Force members, any other questions for Mr. Ward? Isaac, please. Uh, Mr. Ward, um, you said you belong to an organization called MPP. Yeah. Is that a website? Yes, uh, it's mpp.org. Uh, <laughs> yep, and MPP stands for Marijuana Policy Project. Yes, and, sir. And you said you have statistics on this particular website? Yes, we have we have a we have a, a wealth of information. Um, you know, sometimes it may be a little bit hard to figure out exactly where it is, but we have um, you know one one resource I use is actually we have a chart of every legalized state, and then we break it down by uh, the tax rate, uh, what type of licenses are available, personal possession limits, um, and so I'm I'm happy to send that to the committee so you all don't have to search for it. Uh, but if, if there's a, the statistics that I'm going to be looking at, is it embedded in anywhere? Well, the, most of the statistics are from the state. Uh, are from the state itself, um, and and so um, most of them are provided by you know whether it's Colorado or, or Connecticut. Um, most of them are provided either by the statute or by whatever regulatory agency um, regulates their cannabis market. Uh, task force members that are appearing virtually, any of you have any questions for Mr. Ward? Mr. Ward, thanks so much for taking the time to be here. Very much appreciate. Mahalo. Uh, Sherry Lynn. I'm here and I didn't sign up to testify yet. Do you, do you wish to testify? I'm going to reserve that for later. There, there is no lady. Okay. <laughs> so if, if you want to testify, this will be the opportunity to do so. Do you want, do you want to or do you want to pass? No, I'll pass. Oh. Uh, Tan Yan Chen. I'll pass. Yes. All right. Anybody else here who has not officially signed up to this deposition? Can I just? Take back my reservation to not testify. Um, of course. Please, my name is Richard Eckert. I represent. Hold on one second. Just come take a seat. Yeah, and then state your name and the agency. Mm -hmm. My name is Richard Eckert. I represent the Hawaii Medical Cannabis Patient Group. Um, we are mostly interested with patients, patients' rights, not so much as cultivation and cannabis, but um, as far as how health information is handled by um, dispensaries. Um, uh, basically, what I want to do is I just want to say that uh, one of our senators, Brian Schatz, co-introduced a uh, notice of special interest, uh, reopening up research for cannabis. The obstacles for federal research in cannabis are going to become very lax. They are going to need information very quickly. Let's not get caught behind. Let's lead the nation in this conversation. We have the resources. We have a population that cannot just go across the border and get cannabis somewhere else. The adult advent of adult use in Hawaii will mean that people will have access to the finest cannabis in the world. It will not be sent here by mail from somewhere else. But research, please research. Let's do something more than buy cannabis out of the dispensary. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. I'd just like to leave you with a notice and special. All right. We'll make sure that the task force gets a copy of it. Thank you, sir. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to testify before we turn? Yeah, I'd forward? like to testify. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Are we ready to move to our, our phone? <laughs> James Anthony, I would yeah, like to testify. testify. Hello. Can, can you hear me? It's James Anthony. I would love an opportunity to testify. Sure. Can they hear me now? Okay. So we have two people who are calling in by phone. Either of you wish to testify?
So it's James mm -hmm. Anthony on this window, and I would like to testify. Can you hear me? Six, and then let me know. Okay, so you would press pound six, and then let me know whether you wish to testify or not. We're waiting for two people by phone. Okay. We're ready to move to our Zoom participants who wish to testify. Can you come to the order with the MDL? Okay, so if you wish to testify, raise the icon hand and then we'll take you in the order. Makes the speakers go. Alan, Alan, Alan Chin. Yeah, the speakers. Um, yes, I, okay. Can you hear me? Can you unmute yourself when you're there so we can hear you? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Hello? Which one is she? She was the top, second one to the right. I'm not muted. Can you hear me? He's you're just able, not loud enough. You're able to hear. Can you speak? Can you speak a little louder for us? Can you speak a little louder? Task force members, can you hear her? Is that better? She's a, okay. Just to clarify, you are not a, a test for you are a task force member. Okay, so Correct. So, um I just are there any folks on Zoom on Zoom who wish to testify who are not members of the task force? Robert. Yes. Robert, are you there? Hi, this is Robert Benz. Can you hear me? Robert, if you're there, please proceed. Hi, thank you. I am a very disabled uh, medical marijuana patient. So I just, if you can turn up your audio so that we can hear you, task force members, are you able to hear Robert? You are. Some are and some are not. Hi. Uh, sorry, I get a uh, bad internet connection, and uh, with I just want to uh, advocate for severely disabled uh, local long-time patients to uh, be included. Robert, Robert, can you speak your full name? Uh, Robert Benz, be like boy. BNC. All right. And did you finish testifying? I want to make sure that you're finished. Um, I think so. I get a bad internet connection. I'm on the farm. So okay, uh, your, your concern was that we focus on uh severely disabled uh medical patients that are longtime uh Hawaii residents. Okay, thank you. Task Force members, any questions for the gentleman? Seeing none, all right. Who else is up next one? Uh, Mr. Hanley, Jason Hanley. You need to, you, your camera's not on, sir. Get in there, get in there, okay. There you go. Good. All right. If you can stay for you guys. the organization that you're part and then we'll, welcome to hear your testimony, please. I'd be more than happy to. My name is Jason Hanley. I am the owner of Karawailua Farm on the North Shore of Oahu, Mokalea. We are a cooperative with over 1,500 active 329 card old patients in on Oahu. We service the disabled, the elderly, and all the people in need that can't afford medicine at dispensaries and can find a home in our ohana to grow, to educate themselves, and help themselves get affordable meds. I'm very Honored to be here today with the task force team. And I invite all task team members out to my farm and my cooperative to see how a cooperative farm runs and how safe it is, how educational it is, and how good it is for the communities of Hawaii. I also um, am pushing hard for a medical bill and a 21 Overham bill like the state of Maine. Maine is a perfect example of a population of 1.5 million people and providing thousands of local jobs in this cannabis industry. And like I said, I'm very honored to be here 
and I invite all the drug task members out to understand what a cooperative is and see how safe, educational, and kind it is for our community to move forward building better laws and a better space for the cannabis industry in the state of Hawaii. Um, and I think that's all I have. I would just really like the task force to really understand what's going on here with the vertical dispensary model. It's failing our state in a large way and we need a lot of help and it's not getting people medicine. So thank you very much. My name is Jason Hanley and I'm the owner of Karawai Lua Farm. Mr. Hanley, thanks so much for the service you provide our community. Task force members, questions for Mr. Hanley. Yes, please, please proceed. Can you hear me? Mr. Hanley, are you able to hear the task force member? I think I can hear you, yep. Okay, okay. I'm um, questioning how concerned you are about a law that's in motion that's going to end cooperative growth in uh, 2022. That's a great question. We've been tracking um, SB 89, which is a law uh, set up for December 20, 2023 to limit five cards, five through not five through not three to nine card patients per site. Um, of course, as you can see in our model, that is a big problem. Um, we've seen lots of testimony on this um, with even the DOH saying this is only about 10% uh, of our licenses, but I would turn around and say that's about three to 4,000 patients that will be without medicine that cannot afford to go to dispensaries. Um, and so, yeah, that's a big deal. And we're really trying to get that language out of there. We don't really understand why that was set up in place uh, to put in a rule that, first of all, eliminates caregivers and then controls the medicals patients to grow wherever they like and what site they choose. Um, we're very professional. And like I said, we open our doors up to everybody to see this model. It is amazing. It is euphoric. It is saving people's lives. It is helping people with medicine. We have disabled people. We have bedridden people. And to pass a law like that that limits five cards per site, that's definitely going to impact thousands of three to nine card holders. And I would hope that the Drug Task Force Committee is really going to take a look at that really quick and let's get that thing out of here, please. <laughs> that address your question, Wendy. Yeah. Right. Any other task force members have a question? Um, it, I'm sorry for the co-host. I have a difficult time hearing other task force members. I can hear the testimony, but I do not hear the questions. I agree. You're not, you're not, you're not able to hear the questions that the task force members are posing? Yes. Okay. See, and, and I'm not the only one. Um, if task force members can get closer to the mic, like I understood from the answer what the question was, okay. but I really would like to hear the question. Yeah, and I think headsets and microphones really help that out, not just speaking into a computer that really um, dulls the communication. Maybe for next time. <laughs> all right, good. We're learning here. I mean, exactly. We're everybody. all learning. Thanks for your patience as we work our way through this. All right, who else is uh, on Zoom for questions? George, Mr. DeCosta. Mr. DeCosta, are you there? Aloha. Aloha, Chair Broderick and uh, Dual Use Committee Task Force members. Uh, my name is Georgiana DeCosta, and I would like to speak to the dual use format you are exploring. I'm a heroin and methamphetamine addict with more than 20 years in recovery, uh, a chronic pain sufferer, and a 329 card holder. I am the former executive director of the Hawaii Meth Project, and I have provided drug prevention education to thousands of youth and many communities across the state um, about this tough issue of drug addiction and um, substance abuse. Uh, daily, I struggle with pain and immobility due to my multiple chronic conditions. The pain is constant and unbearable at times, particularly in my head and all in my joints. Um, as a former heroin addict, medications such as opiates are not options that I can consider medical cannabis is the only safe pain relief I have and one of the only ways I can get to sleep. Um, but regularly shopping at the dispensary is not cost efficient for me. It is not only the tax rate, but the base rate of the product itself that seems to be so out of reach for many of us patients. We need options that allow us to have equity across the board for all patients. 
because of my illnesses, I'm no longer able to work outside of the home full time. I no longer have the income to continually, continuously pay the high prices in our current very corporate dispensary model. We need our patient led co-ops and grow sites. As it stands now, do not seem to be the, the, the center of the, the state's medical cannabis program, but rather the dispensaries making the money. We need balance and equity now. I just suggest three, three simple things. First, we must preserve the sanctity of the medical program, including safe and equitable access to all patients in need, including these co-ops and shared growth sites for patients in need extra help. And as well as keeping purely recreational us users out of this medical pool, it's important. Second, explore models of dual use in other states, such as New York and Maine, as previously stated which set a path for healthy, sustainable, and manageable growth for the local industry. Finally, I recommend, I highly recommend that Hawaii take serious steps towards engaging youth in communities using a harm reduction approach now, prioritizing youth conversations about how it could be harmful to ingest cannabis while they're still growing is critical. Let's not wait until the federal government moves forward on legalization because that will be too late. We must take our heads out of the sand and face, face, this, face this issue head on. It's not a matter of if, it, it's a matter of when legalization will happen. So let's work out a PONO program for all. I mahalo all of you for your hard work and effort put on this, this uh, project. Mahalo. Mr. Costa, uh, thanks uh, very, very much uh, for, uh, for the very honest and powerful testimony. It's greatly appreciated. Task Force members, mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Am I the only one hearing a lot of reverb from um, the co-host? I hear it also. I hear it also, and it's I very difficult to hear Same. any audio. Okay, that's those virtual. I have a question for Mr. I have a quick question. Do you recommend two sites for research? New York was it Maine, another one? To our Mr. Costa, what, what were the two states that you recommend? I, that is not my area. Um, uh, if, are you asking which states we should look at? Were you in your testimony? You oh, I, I said uh, such as Maine and New York, as mentioned previously. Am I the only person that can't seem to find the type chat box? The message box is missing. Go to the the circles, and then it'll give you an option on the side of it. It's different for everything. All right, uh, I don't hear myself being called to testify. This is James Anthony, but. Um, a task force member is being kind enough to let me know that by text message. So can you hear me? Is this now an appropriate time for me to start my two minutes? I, I cannot hear the chair and, and I'm, I'm not, oh yes, go ahead, Ms. Nakata. Mr. Anthony, please proceed. <laughs> Okay. Um, so my name is James Anthony. Uh, I grew up in Hawaii a long time ago. I went to Roosevelt. I graduated in 1979. Uh, I've lived in, in Honolulu and on the Big Island. I've also lived in, <clears throat> on, the, in, on the West Coast for about 30 years. Uh, I was a California cannabis attorney and I still am for 16 years um, since I was a um, an Oakland, city of Oakland city attorney in the early 2000s. After that, I got into the regulation of medical cannabis, working with uh, dispensaries and other um, locally licensed medical um, providers. And, you know, I, I noticed that I'm, 
I'm very nervous and excited. And I usually, I don't, I don't get excited about public speaking. I've been community organizing all week and speaking publicly and having a great time. But this is a historic occasion right here, this task force, right? This first meeting. And I could not hear all of the opening remarks and introductions. And so I just want to acknowledge that. And I want to thank the chair for trying to do a good job um, under adverse circumstances. And, and hopefully we'll get better as we go along. Uh, I have been working with a group that's been meeting in Hawaii for over a year, going on two years now, on the social equity issue. Because this isn't just a matter of some little regulatory program, right? We are ending the war on cannabis that has put hundreds of thousands of Americans in prison across the nation and tens of thousands of Native Hawaiians. I am Native Hawaiian, my mother was born in Hilo and her mother and her mother and her mother and her mother all the way back, right? So this is very personal for me, not only as a cannabis and medical cannabis advocate, but as a Native Hawaiian. And as somebody mentioned, Hawaii has the opportunity to do something different. And what I suggest that is, is to prioritize the social equity issue and legalize only within that context. Because if you get that part right, then the rest of it will come along. If you try to do it the other way, doing business and regulations and, oh my God, it's like uranium, it's got to be locked up in Fort Knox, then nothing else will work. No social equity program can work on top of an infeasible, highly barred to entry system of regulation. So I really implore you to consider that. I want you to notice if you have any preference for your existing system, because you needn't, and that that is not the charge of this task force. Your task force, your task is to investigate options and present them to the legislature. And I got 16 years of watching California mess this up, all right? California legalization, complete disaster. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair. If, if somebody is talking, I have dead silence in Opihi Kau. I, I don't know, I can see you all. We can hear you, James, but we can't hear the chair either. Sure. Yeah. I do have a question. Get sure. uh, Mr. Anthony, we do, uh, a member has a question for you. Can you hear me? Thank you. This is Wendy, this is Wendy. Gibson Viviani. I'm just wondering if you can tell us which states have good social equity models that we might want to look at. Well, the temptation is to say none because they all did it backwards, right? None of them actually prioritize social equity as the primary concern of ending the war on drugs and making a bunch of rich people richer for something that a bunch of other people are already in prison for, predominantly black and brown people, just coincidentally. However, that said, New York is an interesting model because it's the latest model and every time this happens, the irony that I just described, right, of creating a whole new industry surfacing literally tens of billions of dollars, there's like $69 billion a year of cannabis in the United States. There's like $350 billion a year around the world, right? The largest capitalized cannabis company last year was $600 million. Today, it is Cresco on the Canadian Securities Exchange at $2 billion, right? That is not an environment where if you just kind of open it up, that any kind of social equity can survive. That is just not gonna happen unless you deliberately structure it that way with a sense of what is the correct response to taking care of existing medical growers who frankly have been persecuted in this state for many years, who, you know, no fault of your own. This, this law was written long ago when we were all still figuring it out. Cannabis has been legal for 10 years in Colorado and Washington. Blood is not running in the streets. Babies are not being impaled on pitchforks. Maybe Oklahoma, right? Because Oklahoma has no limit on the number of licenses. Without a limit on the number of licenses, you have a very low barrier to entry. Right? And so far, it does not seem like that marketplace is being monopolized by big money. 
Where you limit the number of licenses, however, right, then you're going to have to figure out how to not just turn that into an auction, right? You're going to turn it into a lottery. It's, it's an insoluble problem. You need to seriously consider not limiting the number of licenses, or if you are going to limit them, limit them and make them available only to companies uh, majority owned by social equity qualified um, persons, uh, victims of the war on drugs, Native Hawaiians, victims of mass incarceration, formerly incarcerated persons, uh, existing medical cannabis growers. You know, if you do that, okay, maybe the limits make sense. So take a look right. at New York. Mr. Anthony, okay. I'm gonna ask you to wrap up. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Anthony? None, all right. Uh, is there an Andrew Simmons? Please, excuse me. Um, May I ask right. the Department of Health to mute all of their microphones except for one because the reverb prevents the rest of us on Zoom from hearing everything that the host is talking about. Um, thank you. And, and there is no chat box, by the way. Thank you, because I kept checking. I noticed it wasn't there. I thought that was loud. Okay. So I'm Andrew Simmons. Can I go ahead? So this is Andrew Simmons. Am, am I good to provide my testimony at this time? Hello, Andrew. Mr. Okay, so, Mr. Simmons, you can please proceed. Okay, thank you. So uh, first off, I wanna uh, thank you for your time on this very important matter. Some people have already stated uh, it's very important to me as an individual and uh, I know it's very important to Hawaii. Um, you guys have a tough job ahead. Um, like Mr. James said, uh, it is a historic moment uh, and you're talking about Hawaii. Hawaii has some of the best cannabis on earth, especially if you're talking sun-grown cannabis. We have an opportunity here to set ourselves up for not just the sales here in Hawaii. We'll, we'll gather the tourists that come here and buy, but you know, eventually we're going to have federal legalization, and we need to have things in place to where Hawaii is set up to start prospering from federal legalization. Every single shop across the country will want Hawaii grown cannabis on its shelf. So I can promise you that they will make room because just like Walmart, they carry products that sell just like Hawaii grown coffee or Hawaii made or grown anything sells and it usually sells for more. The same can be said for Hawaii cannabis. I can't tell you how many visitors come here looking for Hawaii buds. Um, I have a social media account where I post flower from my personal medical garden where I also provide for other patients and random people that I don't know hit me up asking me if they can buy some because they've always wanted to try some Hawaii Pakalolo. So I encourage you to really think this through because this is a major opportunity. Uh, I don't know that it could surpass tourism, but it definitely has the opportunity to at least be second, the second uh, largest income producing thing that has ever, has ever happened to this state. Um, I would encourage you to, like everyone else has said, social equity licenses uh, given to people of Native Hawaiian descent or people that have been impacted by the war on drugs or their family members. Families have been ripped apart by this. People have been taken from their kids and put in jail behind bars over this plant. Something that, my personal opinion, it's no different than a carrot. I was born with a right to grow either of them and in my opinion, no government has the right to tell me otherwise, but I do understand that uh, I will never probably see how I feel it should be. And so I'm here to provide testimony on what I think could be um, a compromise with my own conscience and the government. Um, so anyways, micro tiered license, medium license, social equity, native Hawaiians, those affected by the war on drugs. I really would like to see some sort of crowdfunding site created so that people that aren't in the cannabis industry can also donate or not donate money, invest money into the businesses that will be here so that the money does not leave Hawaii. 
um, because if we do not do something like that, it'll be mainly mainland investors profiting off of, uh, you know, Hawaii people's hard work. Um, the other major point I want to point out, and I know I'm forgetting some things, but is multi-state operators swoop in and a lot of these states that have uh, implemented social equity licenses and they will buy these licenses from these uh, impacted individuals and the people that should be benefiting from it no longer get to the communities that were supposed to get the dollars and the jobs no longer get them. And some big company that has 30 other businesses across, you know, 30 other states has all the money and it's going to be leaving Hawaii. So whatever your decisions are, please don't forget patients. Please don't forget native Hawaiians, those impacted on the world drugs. Please consider how important the decisions you make around this will be because Hawaii cannabis is known around the world to be premium. And I mean, it could be compared to Napa wine. You have the different terroirs and different growers, microclimates. Uh, hey, Mr. Simmons, I'm gonna, ask you, I'm gonna ask you to wrap it up if you could. Mahalo for your time. If you have any questions, I am available for those as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank task, you, sir. Task, task, task force members, questions for Mr. Simmons. Seeing none, thank you. Uh, Scott Gold, are you prepared to testify? Mr. Gold, uh, yes, please thank yes. yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the committee. I'm, my name is Scott Gould. I'm a public health professional. A couple of years ago, I lived in a complex around some very bad men, criminals in many ways. They supplemented their income selling Pacalolo. They grew cannabis in secret remote areas, dried it, and then processed in our complex. I observed them bringing garbage bags full of Pacalolo. They would weigh one gram bundles, wrap in cellophane, and distribute 15 to 20 packets to each of their gangster friends. These petty street criminals would ask visitors if they need anything special, $20 in one hand, packet of Pacalolo in the other, quick unnoticed transaction. These minions could make $300 to $400 in just a couple hours. No need work, knew some business owners. These employees wouldn't come in when flushed with cash, devastating to the business operation. I spoke with undercover police about this activity. Did you see any meth? Cocaine, how about opioids? No, I answered. How about criminal activity like theft or robbery? No, I said. They told me to contact them if I saw real crime. This behavior didn't concern them at all. Some of these men are in prison today, not for Pacalolo, but more violent crimes. I observed them sexually assault and provide drugs to underage teen girls. They disrespected every value of our Ohana. Pacalolo sales supplemented their lifestyle. Police didn't care, they looked the other way. Our prohibition model funds criminals, gangs, and drug cartels. Want to take a bite out of crime? Legalize. A regulated market better protects our keiki and teens. These men would sell to anyone. Have money? They have illegal products. Open, once the door opened, these thugs would provide anything the buyer wanted. No respect, no restraint, no responsibility to our family, islands, or community. This is the result of bad policy, prohibition of cannabis. Things, same thing occurred between 1920 and 1933 with prohibition of alcohol. There are negatives with alcohol use, as well as tobacco and cannabis consumption. However, the devastation for prohibition far exceeds these concerns. Wise Medical Cannabis Community of some 35,000 patients, 18 dispensaries, documents 22 years of responsible, successful behavior. Criminals are never responsible. New Mexico just legalized, so did New Jersey. It's not a question if Hawaii will legalize just when, and the time is now. I submitted written comments and I stand for questions. Thank you, committee, for your time. Thanks, Mr. Gold. Appreciate it. Questions for uh, Mr. Gold? Any task force member who's participating virtually that has a question? Okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Gold. Do we have Thank a Margaret you. Dorsey? Ms. Dorsey, are you there? Um, yes, I am here. Uh, Aloha, Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Margaret Dorsey. Um, regardless of the cannabis treatable disease you or a loved one may suffer from, uh, it is imperative that today you look in your hearts and find empathy for patients. Um, our voices are limited. We are patients. We aren't professional lobbyists. We all are primarily volunteers. Um, we do not regulate. We're not regulators or state employees, and we don't make any money from regulation or dispensaries. Um, I am a mom of three living with lupus. Um, 
An estimated 1.5 million Americans have lupus. At least 16,000 new cases are reported each year. I experience pain and inflammation on a daily basis. Nearly any strain of cannabis will mask the pain. However, certain cannabinoids that reduce inflammation get to the root of the problem. Um, symptoms arise less often, and there's less pain when patients are treated with the correct medicine. We need to be able to source the right cannabinoids. Not all moms can drive to Hilo to see if there's an appropriate strain available. I live 45 minutes from Hilo. Um, my local growers are prevented from growing enough plants to offset the cost of dispensary cannabis. Regulating the number of plants someone can grow to treat me is very confusing. Um, not being able to bring my kids to the dispensary is very limiting. Thousands of people will go to Long's Drugs today through a drive through with their kids in the back of the car, but we're not here to regulate opioids. Um, the state realizes that many patients are having trouble buying medicine, so the legal market is obviously the next step. Like many people have said, it's not if, it's when. Um, more consumers with money, with more money for dispensary investors. Since you are all here to regulate, I'm sure you'll be able to find a way to make medicine affordable or at least available to treat all the state regulated medical conditions that are approved. Um, I couldn't afford to make it today. I don't know who any of you are. It was very confusing that no names were used, only titles. I'm not well versed in all of that. I don't have the time to be necessarily. I do my best. Um, and I really hope that you guys are here to help people suffering from this disease and not just create more monopoly. Um, patients like me want a steady, supportable, steady, affordable supply of cannabis. Um, we have cannabis treated diseases. Our doctors recommend we use cannabis to treat our symptoms. Regulators have prevented others who are suffering from cannabis treatable diseases from participating in the program. If you have any recommendations for new regulations, I hope they will be focused on helping more people, affordable medicine, and less stigma. Mahalo for your time. I appreciate your continued work and support for our communities here in Hawaii. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to share this today. And I wanna add one thing. I think that it is very wrong that we have parents here on the big island who aren't who are 329 patients who are being withheld from their children because they are a 329 patient and I don't understand how we can be talking about legalizing it for everyone when we don't even make it safe for the patients that are legal here already it's just it confuses me um, thank you so much for your time and I am available for any questions Ms. Dorsey thanks for your very personal testimony we appreciate it task force members Questions for Ms. Dorsey, anyone? Seeing none, thank you very much. Is there a Brent Norris? Mr. Norris, please Mahatou, proceed. Sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I am a original founder of Lao Ola. That's one of your eight dispensary licensees. And as such, I wrote the inventory control and management plan, which is basically the whole seed to sale uh, part of the application. Uh, of course, we won our application. Um, and uh, during that time, a, um, a background check was done on me. And it turned out there was a cannabis uh, infraction. It was dropped. There was actually no cannabis, uh, but it left me with a record from uh, high school days uh, that was used to deny my employment at the dispensary. Um, since that time, um, I've worked with different patient organizations and have helped um, a lot of patients with medicine. I'm a grower. Uh, I specialize in strains um, that help folks with specific conditions. And in doing so, I've learned a few things about patients. And one is if you're going to call patients into a meeting um, it's a really good idea to adhere to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, there should be someone here uh, giving sign, uh, especially when we can't hear the proceedings. Um, and then chat should be enabled because it's another way for us to communicate during these meetings. It's, it's not okay to hold meetings like this without talking about patient privacy and what our rights are during this meeting while you're recording it. And we would like those recordings to be made available to each of us. Um, the link to this meeting should be made available in every email you send from this task force. So in the future, um, please include a link uh, to the meetings. Um, it's very, it's upsetting to see my former colleagues in dispensaries, to see unregistered paid lobbyists 
to see people that are acting as though they come from one office, but really they're a board member in another group. The program, the medical cannabis program has not been very well regulated. Our program is entirely bought and paid for right now from outside influences. And all you have to do is look at the, the, your own state records to see who owns what, and you'll find out that all of the dispensaries have been bought and paid for already. This is, this is not something that might happen. This happened already and no one was watching. So it's very important that we reel this program back in for our growers that are, are holding the line by growing as much as possible, risking incarceration so that we can meet the demand of patients. You're asking 200,000 more consumers to come into our, that are already in our state. You're asking 200,000 more consumers. We have 35,000 now. When you bring 200,000 more consumers in, you're going to need the home market to grow more plants. Hey, Mr. Nars, up, Mr. Nars, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you to wrap it up if you could, sir. We have a, a number of other people. Thank you. I, I apologize, and I, I, I stand here in gratitude You're on, mute. on my written testimony. Um, available for any questions. Okay. Any any questions for Mr. Nars? Seeing none. Uh, is there a Rick Collins, Mr. Collins? I don't think Mr. Right. Collins is still yes, with I'm us. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Is there a okay. Clifton Otto? Oh, Mr. Rick Collins, you, Mr. Collins, please proceed. Yes, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Chair and uh, members of the task force. My name is Rick Collins, and um, I am um, providing testimony on behalf of the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Um, we are here um, uh, in a neutral stance, uh, not for or against dual use, but um, we want to um, really implore the task force to ensure that there's public health regulation that is um, uh, uh, recommended in the task force recommendations, we want to make sure that, you know, we um, look at the protection of the public health over um, the profits of um, sometimes a few folks. And um, <clears throat> we'd be happy to uh, provide any recommendations or be here as a resource uh, for that. Um, we have historically, just so you know, uh, opposed, I think, almost all of the um, state legislation uh, for dual use, um, particularly because most of it um, put the, uh, the what, what would I call that, the um, authorizing or the authority um, department through the Department of Taxation or Department of uh, Revenue, whatever, and not um, through the Department of Health. And so we would really recommend that the um, Department of Health be a place to ensure um, that we have good regulatory structures in place that protect young people and protect um, cannabis related uh, consequences. So uh, again, I'm here for any questions and a resource. So thank you for letting me up, uh, providing me the opportunity to provide testimony. Thanks, Mr. Thank Collins. Uh, task Force members, questions for Mr. Collins? Yes, sir, please. Um, can you hear me? Mr. Yes. Um, the American Public Health Association has forwarded that the continued criminalization of drug use and possession has very deleterious impacts on individual public health. Um, toward that end, the Hawaii Public Health uh, Institute uh, recognized that there are significant uh, harms to individuals, families, and, and to the larger community from having people enter our criminal legal system. Uh, through uh, the personal possession and use of cannabis. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, I would say um, I would say yes, and we're concerned about that. Uh, similar to what some folks have said, although I think um, we would, I could give you. I, I don't have some specific details on ensuring an equitable process, but we would uh, certainly are for decriminalizing. Um, uh, possession of of uh, of use or, and, or of uh, cannabis. The other the other recommendation that I would uh, suggest to the task force. You mentioned the American Public Health Institute in uh, September of this past year. They they published a um a, in a book actually called Cannabis Moving Forward. I think Protecting Harms is the name of it. If I can 
uh, I can't quite quote it, something like that, cannabis moving forward, protecting health or protecting harms and um, <clears throat> really uh, moving forward in protecting health. Yeah. It's really for um, states that are looking to um, create dual use or legalize cannabis, and it gives some uh, recommendations within that um, publication. Thanks, Mr. Collins. Task Force members, any other questions? Hearing none, we're proceeding to uh, Clifton Otto. Mr. Otto, are you there? Otto. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Please can you proceed. Me? Can you see me okay? I can't really see myself on the video screen. We can see you very clearly, yes. Great. Okay, well, good, uh, good afternoon, Chair, Task Force members. My name is Dr. Clifton Otto. Thank you for the opportunity to provide uh, testimony today. I believe you have my, my written testimony, which uh, offered some comments on three agenda items that I'd just like to comment on briefly. Uh, agenda item number three, the introductions. I, I might have missed some of it, but I didn't hear anything about a certifying physician or a certifying APRN as a regular task force member. Um, it's a little difficult for me to see how stakeholder interests can be appropriately represented if you're not including those stakeholders who probably know better than anybody else the problems that our patients are currently facing and could face in the future. Um, on agenda item six, so, at, um, so, so on, that, on that last item, um, I believe based on what Mr. Goff said that task force members do have voting uh, authority. And so I would ask that the task force consider voting to include a certifying physician and, and certifying APRN as regular task force members. I also commented on agenda item six, looking forward to the presentation on other state programs. And I'm hoping that this presentation will also touch on solutions uh, that states can take to end this federal conflict. Because right now all of our end users are being treated as federal criminals, even if uh, they're not being directly uh, uh, attacked by the DEA, employers, state agencies, judges are instituting all kinds of discrimination against our patients. So uh, we need solutions for that. And on the last one, uh, discussion on this presentation, um, I would like to ask that the committee consider creating an investigative committee, which is allowed by the task force to look at this issue of how can we end this federal conflict rather than just waiting for the federal government to fix the solution? Are there actions our state could take? I think our legislature needs that support from this kind of task force. They are interested in solving this problem. They have addressed this in a resolution that was given to the Department of Health last session. So anyway, thank you for considering my comments and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Questions for Dr. Yes, first members. Um, this is Jim Ireland. I'm representing Mayor uh, Blanchardi. I just have this a is Wendy Gibson comment. Um, do you have suggestions on which physicians or nurses should be included on the task force? Well, you know, um, I think that it would be wise to include certifying physicians and APRNs that are in favor of a dual use program. Uh, as you probably know, I would rather that our state just stay medical. I think there's a much greater potential in pure medical use within the state. So I think from your previous listening sessions with the uh, certifying providers that you already have a list of, of providers who voiced uh, an interest in helping uh, create a dual use system. So I, I, would, I would look to that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions before we hear? If, and that the chair needs to share something with you, but anyone else? Okay. I, just, I just have a comment. Um, this is James Ireland. I'm the representative for Mayor Blanchiardi, City and County of Honolulu. Hi. I'm, I just uh, wanted um, to let the task force uh, know that we uh, are actually close to time. However, given the uh, technical difficult, the delays due to our technical difficulties at the start of the meeting, and the fact that we have not yet had a chance to hear our speaker, um, who's uh, actually flown in from out of state to, to present, um, we are going to continue the meeting until we no longer have quorum. So hopefully we can get to the presentation. Um, uh, once we no longer have quorum, the meeting will end. Thank you. And I would ask those that are still remaining to testify to, to consider that as well as you share your thoughts with the task force. Uh, Julie Scherer, Julie Scherer, are you there? Yes, please. Yeah. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, um, how about now? I shouldn't be. Yep, you're this good. Has been, 
the, it's, this has been very difficult because you can't see who's speaking. So I go through all the screen trying to find them. And then it would have been great to have that chat because I did have a couple of um, comments I wanted to make to James Anthony and then one to the one who was here because I am listed for my husband who's very ill and hoping I'll start crying because he doesn't have that long to live. So this, we just joined the cannabis program, the 329, very difficult. I go in to buy stuff. I don't know what I'm doing because I've never done cannabis in my life. It's very difficult for me to do that. So. Um, I think I really like what this Wailua Care um, guy, I didn't get his name, was putting because I need someone to help me decide because my husband's also on pain pills. And how do we, how do we gel that? So I, I do like the idea that there should be a physician there. There should be a nurse practitioner there to help. Um, I'm not so much interested in the recreational one, except um, I don't want to smell it next door from the guy over there blowing it into the window because I'm highly, highly allergic to smoke because I'm a heart patient and I had open heart surgery. Those are things that I'm really concerned about. Um, but I really would like to reach out to James Anthony and the Wailua Care guy if I can, if they can, maybe I can just give my phone number or my email address. What, can, what am I allowed to do? Yeah, well, right now we're, we're, we're trying to focus on the agenda. Okay. Uh, you, can, okay. you can contact the Department of Health and they'll give you that contact information, but it's okay, really great. important now that we move forward on the, yeah, on the agenda. Yeah, great, great. Well, that's are, are, my you, thoughts Are you on done it. with your testimony? Um, no, except that I do think if they take away the caregiver, my husband's not capable, he's bedridden and stuff. So if they take away a caregiver program and stuff like that, then, you know, he's pretty much screwed. That's all I've got well, to say. All right. Thank you. Questions for Michelle. Questions. Very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. I have a Sadiga, S-A-D-I-G-A. Yes. There you go. Yes. Yes. Um, I'll be brief. So Thank you. Thank you. in terms of a physician, there's plenty. Um, my husband is a Queen. He's an anesthesiologist, Lieutenant Colonel. And um, we have very personal reasons for why this plan is special. And um, he does medical cards. And a role in this committee would be significant because there are military spouses, there are military families, there are vets, and they should be included in this. I see that camels here on board. Um, there's a lot of advocates that have stories. You probably know all of them, but in terms of social justice, equity, in terms of um, actually doing research, it's very important. Um, he doesn't know <laughs> I'm on this call, but he's in the hospital working now. And there is a way that you can do research. He went to University of Chicago, did research on um, addiction and cannabis is known to be an exit drug. As an anesthesiologist, he has seen patient testimony, he has verified medical records showing that within a couple of months, they are no longer on opioids. And so I really just want you guys to pay attention to the resources that are in your community, um, not just the advocates, but the caregivers. Um, and what they're doing on the North Shore is tremendous. You really need to consider the New York and Maine model. And you do have a plethora of, of good resources. There could be prosperity here. Um, so anyway, I wasn't going to say anything, but I'm so grateful that you guys are doing this work. That's it. Thank you very much. You very Questions much. for the witness. The chair, I, I don't have a question for the witness, but we do have Dr. Jim Ireland on the task force on the lower school there. So we do have a medical professional on this task force. Thank very you for good. noting that, Mr. Troy. Uh, I have okay. a, I don't have a name, but it says iPad 9 PAM, P-A-M. Are, are you there? And if so, uh, do you wish to testify? I don't, I don't see any uh, person, but I see a hand up. Okay. Uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, J James Trice. God damn it. Hey, how's everybody doing? <clears throat> Most of the people on this call probably see me before. Mr. Trice, we cannot hear, we cannot hear you. You said you cannot hear me? Now we can. Now we can. Uh, there we go. How you doing? My name is James Trice. I'm combat medic, patient advocate, veterans advocate, and I advocate for spouses and dependents. Um, this is a pretty nice meeting. Uh, a little disheartening because it reminds me of House Bill 321 relating to dispensaries. So I might as well just get to it. Um, first, 
um, on for medical use, but for recreational use or adult use, we need more research. Without evidence-based research to support this initiative, I cannot fully go through with that. Um, marijuana versus cannabis verbiage is very important. We have to fix the language. Um, definitely work on decriminalization of possession as long as they aren't actively smoking in public places. You can have medication on you, but not be partaking in public pl places such as parks and near buildings. Fixed income patients cannot afford these prices at the dispensaries. And I myself, 100% uh, disabled uh, from the army, uh, fixed income is a big issue in Hawaii, not just for home ownership, but for medication purposes. Uh, patients' right to grow is irrevocable as it is a human necessity for survival. We really need to sit down and get our verbiage correct on some of these initiatives. Uh, states with social equity, I would say Oklahoma. Um, limited uh, limit the licenses and provide mandatory education for dispensaries and licensees or license holders. Good places to actually look at outside of Oklahoma would be a place like Puerto Rico or, uh, I'm sorry, Virginia, as Virginia is a lot more rural than many of these other states that people are looking at. California has a much larger population than Hawaii. That's apples to oranges you're comparing. Colorado, Oregon, that's apples to oranges. You got to look at smaller populations and population density when considering these things. Sensory education, I've done it already. For those of you who know me, you've seen me outside of NOAA Botanicals for many, many months, if not years, doing vaping education, growing, smoking cessation, and talking about the bioavailability of cannabis in your bloodstream, because this is something that spouses and dependents need to know when taking care of their patients, i.e. caretakers. Um, Cannabis sorry forms going on everywhere, the war on drugs, but we should look at this for ourselves with Judge Kubo and Camo regarding workforce development and reintegration into society. Uh, 329. Sorry, so I'm going to ask you to wrap it up. And I'm on it, trust me. The 329 program is very great. I do approve of the 329 program. I would like to ask that they simply open it up and make it larger and add a few more people on there, such as people who are disabled veterans and Native Hawaiians and other outside minorities, because we get plenty of people from Pacific Rim, not just on our island, but patients from American Samoa and Guam regularly. If you need me, please contact me, uh, 808camo at gmail.com, and I look forward to hearing from you all. Thanks, Thank you for Mr. Your time. Thanks, Mr. Thanks, Trice. Trice. And before we entertain questions, Thank you for your Thank military you for service. service. Great, hey, appreciate it. Task Force uh, members, any questions for Mr. Trice? Hearing none, uh, the last testifier that I've been given is Greg Jap Japkus. Mr. Japkus. Aloha, my name is Greg Chapkis. I'm the Executive Director of uh, Coalition for a Drug-Free Hawaii. So we primarily do uh, programs with youth and, uh, and drugs and prevention. Um, we told, first of all, we totally agree that the medical programs are important. Decriminalization is important for uh, social justice and equity. And um, you, you need to look at kind of both sides of the ledger on this though. If uh, for those in treatment, um, minorities are disproportionately represented as well. So if you look at adolescents in treatment, 60% of adolescents in state funded treatment are therefore cannabis use disorder. Cannabis is, as we know, illegal and illegal for adolescents, but the primarily, um, primary drug of choice for those in treatment are adolescents. Um, and that converts to meth as they get to adults. But I would say that we know that three, three drugs are primary drugs of entry for adolescents. It's yeah. just alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. And those are the drugs of choice for, uh, for youth. And um, after a while, those maybe become less attractive and someone wants something harder. And there's a lot of evidence that 90% of substance use disorders begin in adolescence. The earlier they start using, the more likely they are to develop a substance use disorder. Lastly, I just wanna say, please look at the other experts as others have mentioned, ask the police, they're against it. Ask the doctors, they're against it. Department of Transportation, they are against it um, for impaired driving. We have our own um, Dr. Bill Hanning from Jabsum here. He is the either president or past president of ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine. 
they wrote a wonderful statement last year on cannabis policy, and it uh, it covers all of these things. So please, um, I know you're doing your job. Just consult the experts. And um, again, I encourage you to kind of look at both sides of the ledger. A lot of people have been talking about the pros of these programs. We need to look at the other side too, the costs. What are going to be the societal costs? Black market does not decrease. It hasn't decreased in Colorado or in California, and it's been really rough. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Questions from the task force. And he is our last testifier. Hearing none, okay. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, everyone. Um, at this time, I am very honored and excited to introduce uh, Dr. Jillian Schauer. Uh, she is the executive director of the Cannabis Regulators Association and affiliate researcher at the University of Washington. Dr. Schauer has a PhD from Emory University, a Master of Public Health from the University of Washington, and a Bachelor of Science from Northwestern University. Uh, she brings a decade of experience working with federal and state agencies on cannabis policy and has more than 65 peer-reviewed research publications on cannabis and other substances. So to help kickstart um, the dual use task force, Dr. Schauer will prov provide us with a sampling of policies that have been implemented by other states um, that have legalized adult use. Um, and the, these are primarily just to give the task force members um, some uh, items for consideration. Welcome, Dr. Schauer. Thanks, Michelle. Can everybody hear me clearly? There's no echo. Okay, great. Um, I think now I just need to figure out if I'm allowed to share my slides. Um, so I'll, I'll give it a minute. Um, maybe since we're short on time while they're waiting to figure out how I can be allowed to share my slides, I just wanted to provide a little bit of additional um, background information about the Cannabis Regulators Association. We've been around for about a year and a half. We convene cannabis regulators from 43 different states and territories. Michelle Nakata is actually on the board of the organization. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We don't take an official position for or against legalization. Rather, we seek to provide learning across regulators that are implementing cannabis uh, legalization programs for medical or adult use. Um, and we work through committees and um, a board that are staffed by folks from regulatory agencies. Um, so happy to be a resource to this committee. I have a short time with you today to talk about policy. Um, and so I'm happy to uh, share resources that CANRA has or um, provide further information on topics that we won't get to today. So now it does look like I'm able to share my screen. So hopefully everybody can see this in the room and online. Uh, great. So here's the map of CANRA so you can see who our members are and Hawaii is a member of the Cannabis Regulators Association. Um, and hopefully you're excited about CANRA. I have to acknowledge up front that I have nothing to disclose in what I'm going to share with you today. While it does represent um, my experience working with states over the past decade on cannabis policy and it represents policy tracking that we do, it's not an official position of CANRA or any of the agencies or states that I work with. So I was asked to briefly cover some of the science. I do have a PhD. Um, I was asked to sort of briefly review where we are with the science so that you have that for context. And then I'll go through the current policy landscape, um, provide a comparison of adult use cannabis policies across states in certain areas, um, and some comments on illicit versus licit markets and uh, hemp. So I always start with the health benefits of cannabis and cannabinoids. I think this is something that is somewhat unique for cannabis as a substance and very different than say commercial tobacco, for example. Um, there is strong science to support benefits for cannabis and cannabinoids. Right now, the science is strongest for chronic pain relief, relief of nausea, appetite stimulation, patient reported symptoms of multiple sclerosis, rare seizure disorders, and some evidence for sleep. There are four FDA approved drugs. One of those drugs is derived from the plant itself. Um, and states, including Hawaii, may authorize much broader medical use. The science, as you've heard from people who've testified, has been very delayed in part because of the Schedule One designation of cannabis. And so what we know about the potential medicinal benefits of cannabis is behind because we have not been able to conduct science. So um, I think that's important context as you look at uh, this topic. 
on balance, um, there are some potential health risks of cannabis. And I'm gonna talk about how those can be mitigated by policy. I think that's an important discussion topic that you all have um, for your task force. Um, I always like to start this by saying, I think we're living in an era where you can find a study to support whatever you wanna say about the health effects of cannabis. There is a, at least a single study out there to say whatever you wanna say. So it's very important that you're looking at reviews and meta-analytic work. What that means is they're taking the aggregate of the science to determine what has a robust body of research around it. And I've listed three on the right hand of your screen. Um, the National Academies of Sciences put out a 2017 report on the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. They cover benefits and risks. Um, the state of Colorado is legislatively mandated every two years to put out a health effects report. And they use a very rigorous review process for that. And those reports are excellent. Their most recent report is in 2020. And then there's a WHO report that is somewhat dated now from 2016. The other thing I like to say before I go through what some of the risks um, are is that um, because the science has been so far behind policy, most of what I'm going to share with you today is by association. It is not causal. And that's a real detriment because, um, you know, there can be a lot of reasons that something can be by association. It doesn't necessarily mean that cannabis is causing what I'm talking with you about. So what are the risks? Um, there's some acute risks. Impaired uh, Using cannabis can impair motor vehicle coordination and reaction time. That has been associated with an increased risk of crash. That increase is much more likely when cannabis is combined with alcohol. Um, in high doses, and especially among naive consumers, acute psychosis and paranoia are possible. Um, and you know, there are some public education that can help mitigate against some of that and serving size, et cetera. On the longer term consequences, we know that, that using cannabis, especially when you're young and in high uh, frequency or high quantities, can change the way the brain develops. Um, we know that this can impact memory, learning, and attention. Uh, Colorado's recent report suggests that this can also impact uh, educational achievement. There's an association with a decrease in educational achievement. Um, and it's not clear how long-term these effects may be. Um, it does appear that in youth who stop using cannabis uh, a month later, they do have improvements in their academic achievement. Um, there are pregnancy-related outcomes. Here, the biggest one that we have science around is lower birth weight. Um, there's also some science that there may be impacts on the offspring in pregnant individuals who use cannabis. Mental health outcomes, we actually have a fair amount of research in this topic. Um, the primary one of concern is in association with schizophrenia, a diagnosis of schizophrenia, um, more severe diagnosis, more severe symptoms, especially in youth who begin using at a younger age and use in higher quantities. Um, and it does appear that that's more likely in people that have a family history of schizophrenia. It just may result in an earlier diagnosis or more severe diagnosis for them. And then the other one um, is uh, an association with suicide ideation, attempt, and completion. Again, very um, the association is strongest in youth who are using and who are using um, high frequency of cannabis. Um, there are respiratory and cardiovascular effects, mostly from smoke forms of cannabis, and mostly um, at this point, the science suggests bronchitis. Um, there can be, according to the most recent Colorado report, a slight increase in stroke in individuals as well who are using combusted forms. Cannabis use disorder is possible, as some of the individuals who testified alluded to, there can be dependence and addiction, and you'll see that many states allocate money towards treatment. And then I'm often asked about a, a gateway effect, and right now the science does not support a gateway effect. The science does not support that if, in, if a youth is using cannabis, they go on to use other drugs, although there is a phenomenon of poly substance use. What the science supports is that um, in some cases, if you are using cannabis, again, typically in high quantities, um, you can have a harder time quitting other substances. So I encourage you to look at the reports again that I alluded to if you want more information here. Um, we're in a nascent stage and the science, as I mentioned, is behind the policy. Um, cannabis is not one thing. There are more than a hundred different cannabinoids. It can be used in many different forms, modes of use. As legalization has happened, modes of use and patterns of use have changed and that may change what we know about the science. But I wanted to present sort of where we are now. So shifting to policy, um, this is a map of sort of where the US policy is to date with of course the states in dark green being those with legal adult use and medical use, the sites states in light green being those with legal medical use and the states in yellow being those with low THC or CBD programs. And um, we've really seen in the last two years an exponential increase in states that are legalizing adult use. Um, you can see that 2020, 2021 number more than doubles what we've seen in every previous year. 
And these, this is a list of all the states that have legalized adult use to date and how they've legalized. You can also see when their marketplace opened. And I mentioned this to the task force because this is a, a critical time frame. We've seen about 18 to 24 months between legalization and the marketplace opening. Um, many people want to make that faster in part because once legalization happens, the illicit market can grow while you're waiting for locations that can actually sell the product. On the other hand, it's a huge ask to set up an entire regulatory system in even 18 to 24 months. So um, a balance is necessary there. And you can see that many states have opted to sort of jumpstart their program through medical dispensaries. I'm going to talk in a moment about social equity, but there is some evidence coming out of states that are doing this that they may result, they may have a marketplace that is less equitable when that is done. So again, you know, important to consider for Hawaii. Um, and then you can see there's been a change to how legalization has happened. Um, the early states were all ballot measure, which created some limitations. Uh, states that have legalized since have primarily been legislative, and um, that's what this task force is set up to put recommendations towards. The way legalization is happening beyond being legislative has also changed. The early states that you might look to, Washington and Colorado, those states legalized in the era of the Cole Memo, which basically was a memo that provided a list of things so that the feds would not come knock down the door and shut down the program. And states were very adherent to try to make the federal engagement with the program as minimal as possible. Since then, though, we've um, had the vaping lung injury outbreak that I think has put a spotlight on uh, consumer safety in a big way. Um, we've had a number of studies that have shown that just legalizing is insufficient to repair the harms of social uh, of equity and, and um, justice and that you have to do legalization with a purpose to actually make an impact there. Um, and then we've also had hemp legalized uh, federally, which has created, as I'll talk about at the end, a bit of a dual system. So I think there's an increased focus in the states that are our members in focusing on social equity and restorative justice, public health and consumer safety, and increased parity across regulations for cannabis, being that medical, adult use, and hemp. So there are a lot of different policy variables that I could talk about, probably more than 100, and I was asked to just focus in on a couple today. Again, happy to come back and share more as you get into the details. Um, the first one I want to start with is what regulatory scheme is chosen. Um, this is from a paper that we'll make sure you all have access to by Bo Kilmer, who's uh, um, with RAND. And he's basically laid out a variety of different frameworks for legalization, um, everything from complete prohibition, but decreasing sanctions, um, which is sort of where we've been down at the left hand of this um, chart, all the way to a standard commercial model. And every state that has legalized adult use in the US to date has chosen the standard commercial model. When you look at other countries, though, that's not the case. You can look at some of the provinces in Canada, and you can look at a number of other countries that have chosen regulatory schemes that are somewhere near the middle here. Retail only sales, a government operated supply chain, a monopoly that's public, nonprofit organizations for benefit companies, so I just show this because um, I think it's valuable for you all to discuss what is the right frame for Hawaii and for your goals. So who regulates cannabis? Um, early in, in the early states, regulation was primarily in liquor, alcohol, and beverage control boards and departments of revenue, taxation, and finance. You can see Washington and Colorado, Oregon and Alaska all falling there. What we've really seen in the last four or five years has been an increase in the use of a separate cannabis regulatory agency or commission that is a standalone agency um, that reports directly to the governor's office. And that's what we see in the six states that are listed. Um, a couple states have chosen to regulate through their Department of Regulation and licensing. One state regulates through their Department of Consumer Protection, Connecticut, and Arizona regulates through their Department of Public Health. This is an important question because the, the agency with which you put regulation can frame a lot of the rules and um, sort of the ethos of the program. So what are the taxes and where do they go? Um, we've seen retail excise and wholesale taxes vary widely across states from 6.6% excise tax in New Jersey, all the way to 37% excise tax in my home state of Washington. I think it is interesting to note, I grew up in Oregon, I live in Washington. Um, Oregon has a 17% tax, Washington has a 37% tax. You can still find $3 grams in both states. So um, you know, a, a lot more analysis is needed on the tax side and there's some tax experts that I'd be happy to connect you with that have done scholarly work in this space. Alaska is the only state that has no point of sale excise tax. Their taxes are wholesale tax only. 
And Illinois and New York are the only states that have a THC-based tax. And in New York's case, that's what's in statute. They've not yet put that into place. A THC-based tax may be a policy option to address concentrates, which you will probably have constituencies that come um, talk to you about concerns around concentrates because of their potential impact on dependents and on, on youth and potentially mental health outcomes. I'll talk a bit more about concentrates later, but I think the THC-based tax is kind of a new thing that we're seeing states try. Um, what do taxes fund? This varies widely across states as well. I won't read everything off, but you can see it funds everything from school, public health, mental health, public safety, research, govern local governments, roads, um, et cetera. I wanna talk about two areas of funding. Um, one is uh, emphasis on equity and restorative justice. And this really in states is starting to look more like a three-legged stool. And I think all three legs of that stool are important for this task force to consider. One is equity in the marketplace. How diverse is your marketplace? Who's able to enter your marketplace? How successful are they able to be? I could give a whole presentation just on this. Um, another one though, that's often not discussed at the outset, but is very important for restorative justice is expungement and resentencing. <laughs> expungement should be automatic. People should not have to spend a lot of time, get a lawyer to have this happen. And that costs the state money to do automatic expungement. So that's a budgetary concern that you may wanna consider at the outset. And there are a number of different state regulators that would probably happily connect with you on the challenges their states have had in carrying that out. And then the last one is community reinvestment. And I think this has a, a big potential to bridge disparities that exist well beyond cannabis. We know that some communities have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs and giving some of the tax money back to those communities for a broad range of things, job placement, mental health or substance use treatment, system navigation <laughs> services, legal services, reentry, linkages to healthcare, housing, violence prevention, youth development um, can be really impactful. And you heard from the Marijuana Policy Project individual who testified that we're starting to see a lot of states do that. New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, um, Virginia was slated to put a big chunk of their tax money back into the community for these types of outcomes. The other area I want to talk about for um, allocation of tax funds is public education campaigns. Um, when legalization has happened in states, it's become very clear to regulators and others that work at the state level that there can be a lot of confusion about the law, what the law means. And so um, it's important to consider putting money towards education about the law so that um, Hawaiians understand what law passes um, so that they have education about what you know happens in impaired driving, what the repercussions are, how to take safe steps there, campaigns for kids and parents or trusted adults to talk to kids about cannabis, campaigns for pregnant and breastfeeding individuals, and responsible adult use for consumer safety. So you can see a wide variety of states have done this, happy to connect you with any of those states. It's varied where the funding goes for this. Sometimes it goes to public health, sometimes it stays with the regulatory agency, sometimes it goes to an outside group, but I think this is an important consideration. So how is the market structured? In all states that have legalized adult use, um, there are cultivator, processor, and re retailer licenses. I'm going to jump down to my next bullet to talk about vertical integration. That means that you can possess all three of those licenses. That is how the medical system in Hawaii is currently set up. It's vertically integrated. Um, on the adult use side, vertical integration is allowed but not required in most states. It is not allowed in Washington state and it is not allowed in the state of New York. There have been some concerns raised about vertical integration creating problems for equity ownership. Um, I think those concerns are ones that your uh, task force might want to explore further with scholars that have really looked at this closely. Um, and it may be that vertical integration is something that exists on a smaller scale for craft grow um, you know, operations or Hawaii grown. I think you have a lot to sort of think about in terms of how the market's structured. But the two states that don't allow it are Washington and New York. Increasingly, we see states licensing delivery and social consumption as well. I'll talk about social consumption in a bit. Um, and I, I think there are considerations for this as well. Delivery can offer products to people that may have trouble getting out of the house for any variety of reason. Um, delivery you know, may also uh, allow for access to products by people who are underage. So I think there are a lot of questions that have not been resolved in the science there. 
and I'll talk about social consumption at the end. Um, adult use home grow, and I, I know Hawaii has a long tradition of home grow, so you know you are in a very novel situation. I don't think there's any state that quite has the reality that Hawaii has on the ground, um, but that has been allowed in all states except Washington and Illinois, and in Nevada they set some criteria um, trying to push people towards the regulated uh, retail marketplace, so you have to be more than 25 miles from a retailer to um, be able to have adult use home grow. All states continue to allow medical home grow. In terms of product types and forms that are legal, we've seen very little action here from states in terms of policy. Um, there are a couple states, uh, Washington and California and Michigan, that primarily allow shelf-stable edibles only. So they don't allow edibles that have to be refrigerated. That has to do predominantly with food inspection issues because cannabis is still a Schedule One substance and food inspectors often receive federal funding. So that can be very difficult. Um, increasingly, we are seeing a couple states, Vermont and Connecticut that have um, created a threshold for THC in products or a THC um, sort of concentration cap. Vermont statutes say no more than 60% of the products can be THC, and Connecticut says no more than 60% unless it's a vape cartridge. Um, I think there's some considerations here that maybe haven't been fully thought through. When you have, say, a vape cartridge and you limit the quantity to 60%, 40% of that vape cartridge has to be something else. And on the heels of the vaping lung injury outbreak, um, there may be some concerns that that would mean that you are you're basically requiring people to use diluents and excipients. So to remind you all about the vaping lung injury outbreak that happened in 2019, it was primarily due to illicit market cannabis product, and it was primarily associated with vitamin E acetate, which is an additive that is used um, was used in vape cartridges. There are a bunch of other additives that can be used in vape cartridges. And so following E-Valley, there's been a big focus in creating policy on which of these diluents and excipients are safe. Do we know that any of them are safe? Which of them are inherent? Currently dangerous. There have been a number, number of states that have restricted the types of additives that can be in products. Um, the vaping lung injury outbreak also put more scrutiny on the kind of flavoring additives, and flavors for cannabis are very different than flavors for tobacco. Terpenes are the flavoring agent, and they naturally occur in the plant, but they can come from cannabis, they can come from another plant-derived item, or they can be manufactured in a lab and be synthetic. And so we have seen states fall on different um, ends of the spectrum in terms of which terpenes means they're going to allow. We've also seen states look at the quantity of additives that they're going to allow in products. So the, the state of Nevada does not allow more than 10% of a vape cartridge, for example, to be any additive product. Um, and all states that have legalized adult use have uh, statutes or rules that no nicotine or alcohol can be added to the cannabis products that are for sale. Um, I'll skip these other things. Happy to come back to them. Um, product testing is another thing that really came under scrutiny following the vaping lung injury outbreak. In all adult use states, these, these, this testing happens through a third party lab system where the state is licensing labs. Those labs have as their um, customers the industry and they are conducting the testing. Um, I think this is primarily happening this way because again of the schedule one designation of cannabis and can create some challenges. There are documented and happy to provide you with the studies and articles. There, there's documented occurrences of lab shopping to try to get certain test results. Um, and so that can make it very important for states to have a state reference lab or a quality assurance lab. That is something that is typically created in statute. Um, and that is a lab that could arbitrate on testing challenges that occur that could serve to sort of over see the third party testing labs and could be a testing lab for the regulators should they need to test something. Um, there's a lot of variation across states in terms of what they're testing for and when and how they're testing. I will just note that in addition to being on the board for CANRA, Michelle Nakata co-chairs our lab testing and product safety committee and is a great resource on this topic. Packaging and labeling. So there are some inherent challenges to the way that most states have written statute around packaging and labeling. Most states have broad language that packages cannot appeal to youth. They may go further and say packages can't use certain um, fonts, certain colors, certain cartoons or images, um, but that can be very hard to enforce. Um, you may be thinking that I'm talking about the items on the top. These are actually illegal market items. You will not see any items like this in any adult use cannabis state. You will see items though, like the ones on the bottom. And I think many of us would suggest that these might have some appeal to youth. Um, and so I think there's been a challenge in terms of enforcing cannot appeal to youth in the way that statutes have currently been written. 
I'm going to talk about some possible policy solutions that we're seeing out of some of the East Coast states in a second. The other big issue on packaging and labeling is effectively reaching consumers with essential warnings and information. You can see below a couple examples of warning labels. These read in all states more like a legal disclaimer. It is very small font. It is extremely difficult, I would venture, for any consumer to really get much out of these warning labels. Um, and in fact, consumers, we know from some data through the International Cannabis Policy Study, which is a nonpartisan study that's conducted out of um, University of Waterloo in Canada and looks at Canadian provinces and adult use states, we know that consumers are fairly uneducated about the types of products that they're consuming. So there's a big opportunity to do a better job educating consumers. Um, when asked if they knew the amount of THC or CBD in the product they last used, you can see the American flag with the pot leaf over it. Those are adult use states and less than a third of people could identify what the THC or CBD ratio in the product they'd used was. When asked to identify how much THC was in the product, um, the average was 33%, which I have rarely seen any flower that reaches that. So again, <laughs> suggesting that consumer, there's a big opportunity to educate consumers. So increasingly in, in states that have legalized adult use, we see a focus on plain, uniform, and opaque packaging. Uh, the state of Connecticut is slated to implement plain, uniform packaging. Um, you can see some examples of that from Canada right here at the very top of the screen. And in fact, uh, Hawaii's current medical market uses is plain packaging. So this is something that is not new to all of you in Hawaii. This can make enforcement much easier, makes it very clean so that it's, it's clear that products aren't going to appeal to kids. Um, and we've seen statutes, as I said, Connecticut is set to implement this. New York also has the ability and statute to put plain packaging into place. And many medical programs use plain packaging. Um, there are more prominent and clear warnings that are appearing in statute. Again, you can see from Canada's example, they have half of the package is a yellow warning. It's a single warning. It rotates across packages so that consumers have maybe a better chance of reading and retaining what they're um, seeing on the package. The universal symbol has become standard, and you can see some examples of that on all products throughout adult use states. Increasingly, we're seeing states consider the inclusion of a poison center phone number or drug information website so that if consumers need to reach out about an adverse event, they know exactly where to go. And increasingly, we're seeing states look to label for total THC, not just Delta 9 THC, so that consumers can get a better sense of how impairing the product might be or how they need to um, dose it for what they're seeking. Um, advertising has presented another challenge for adult use states. Um, it's important to uh, consider advertising when we think about preventing youth exposure. Um, however, social media advertising and third party advertising have been challenging for states. They're typically, the statutes around advertising have not been written to include those. Increasingly, though, we see some of these new East Coast states that have legalized taking a different approach. So um, most states, for example, are borrowing a provision from alcohol in statute and say that no more than 71.6% of the viewership of uh, advertising advertisement for a cannabis product can be reasonably expected to be um, underage. When stated differently, almost a third of your viewers under that statute could be underage. And so we've seen states like Connecticut move the threshold there. So Connecticut will be using 90% the viewership audience has to be 90% adult. Um, and the state of New Jersey is using for many different things like events and sponsor sponsorships, they're using 80%. Um, and we've also seen states like New Jersey and Connecticut take a closer look at online and take a closer look at third party advertising so that the advertising provisions in statute don't just apply to licensees, they apply more broadly to um, entities that might be advertising on behalf of licensees. Um, so I think there's a lot of novel policy coming out here to try to make sure that you know advertising can occur, but to the right audience. Um, limitations or bans on advertising in certain outlets also exist. Um, there are a handful of states that ban billboards, for example, or in the case of California, billboards are banned on interstates that cross state lines, et cetera. Um, and then increasingly states are requiring warnings on advertisements as well. Um, so where are people allowed to consume the products? Um, this is a very complicated 
uh, policy. And I think we typically see statutes sort of kick the can down the road on this and allow for this door to be opened if and when rules are approved around it. This is complicated, especially for a state like Hawaii, because you will have tourism around cannabis and tourists will need a place to consume. Um, there's also an equity argument to be had here because, um, you know, individuals who may be in rented housing or federal housing are not able to use cannabis on their, um, in their house. However, on, on balance, there is some science suggesting that combusted cannabis, for example, does contain some of the same constituents as tobacco. And in animal models so far, it seem, seems to have some of the same health effects. So the science is really emerging on what we know about secondhand cannabis smoke. Um, but with that said, it's not an easy policy area to sort of balance um, the needs around tourism balance equity and balance uh, protecting public health and consumer safety and the safety of people that may work in these environments. So what we've seen states do, there are still three states that prohibit social consumption, Maine, Oregon, and Washington. Um, it's also prohibited in Massachusetts um, because it's currently in violation of another law. So they've allowed it, but it's not allowed to be implemented. Um, it's allowed in California and Illinois on the local level. So there's no state license. What they've decided is that if locals want to allow it, they will create some exemptions in the clean indoor air policy and um, the locality can sort of navigate those. And then there are four states, Alaska, Colorado, Michigan, and Nevada that allow it with a statewide license, but local approval is needed. This is one of those topics that is extremely complex and has a lot of science behind it. Happy to come back and chat with you all about it um, when I have more time. I, I can't do it justice in a half an hour presentation, but wanted to present some of what's out there in states. Um, protecting medical access and patients. We do see in um, adult use states a variety of approaches to this. There are some states like my home state of Washington that now have only one marketplace. There are no longer separate dispensaries that um, cater to medical individuals. I think um, you'll hear from the regulator in Washington at a future meeting, and there are both pros and cons to this approach. Other states have allowed dispensaries to continue to exist, and some have allowed them to be side by side with adult use. Um, marketplaces. So you may walk in, for example, in Colorado, you may walk into a retail outlet and half the store is for medical patients with a cart and half the store is for adult use patients. And most of the operators of those stores would tell you there's not a huge difference except in tax and maybe in some of the quantity of products that you can buy. I think there are a variety of policy considerations that have not been um, addressed by states that have legalized to date. Um, so I'm going to walk through those briefly. One is protecting patient access to cannabis. There are a couple states that have rules to require a certain supply that's dedicated for patients. Massachusetts is one of those states, for example. Um, incentivizing entities that are uh, producing and selling cannabis products to continue to produce certain medical products that may not be viable in terms of the um, cost benefit calculus, but are very important for medical patients. We've not seen a lot of states do, do this, um, but I think this is a really important thing to consider in policy. Preserving patient access to information. Um, so you have to consider the environment where patients are going to access products. Are they going to get the information they need about those products? And are they going to have assurances that their data are protected? And then considering patient preferences for points of access. Do patients want to go into an adult use store? Um, do they have preferences around, you know, keeping things more medical? All of these are questions that I think your task force um, should be looking at. Um, licit versus illicit markets. Um, you know, I think it's clear that your task force is focused on uh, putting forward recommendations for if and when adult use is legal in Hawaii. I will just mention, especially on the heels of the vaping lung injury outbreak, that there can be some public health and consumer safety benefits to having a, a legal market. Um, those benefits can include the fact that there are tested and regulated products. Um, all states that have legalized adult use to date have legalized it in an adult only sales environment. Um, that is not generally allowed to sell very much of anything else. So it's a standalone um, adult sales environment. And the compliance with that has been very high, much higher than we would see for say tobacco or alcohol. Most states would report to you that they have 96% or higher compliance with that adult only sales. Um, Childproof packaging um, has come out of legal markets and is very important and valuable. Uh, labeling, the ability to recall products if there's a safety issue, uh, regulation over ingredients and education opportunities. Some additional considerations for your task force. As I mentioned in 2018, the Farm Bill legalized hemp federally. 
And what we've seen um, is really the advent of a marketplace that in many states looks very similar to the adult use marketplace. You can purchase um, impairing products on that marketplace, on the hemp marketplace with far fewer barriers to entry. Um, and I, I think this needs to be considered. It would be hard to legalize adult use in any state now without considering the fact that there is this parallel market. Hemp products in most states are not subjected to the same packaging and labeling requirements. Consumers do not understand, I believe, what those products are in most cases. Um, they're not subject, subjected to the same testing requirements. Um, some new cannabinoid products that we're seeing, like HHC and THCO acetate, have no data from use of humans. Um, there can be potential dangerous um, occurrences in manufacturing because there's no regulatory oversight. We know that these products can have byproducts that are not um, previously identified. And so, um, and they're widely available in retail outlets and online and widely available to youth. They may also undermine adult use markets. So um, I would encourage you all as you think about legalizing adult use in Hawaii and recommendations that you have, um, not just to consider how adult use legalization would mesh with your existing medical program, but also to consider how it would mesh with the existing hemp marketplace that you may have in Hawaii. So in conclusion, um, science supports medicinal use for cannabis, but there can also be risks for cannabis use. And there are certain policies that can help mitigate against these risks, especially um, access by youth and uh, the amount that people can consume. Um, there are policies that have importance to public and consumer safety and prevention of youth access. Um, those include, include policies related to product ingredients, testing, packaging and labeling and advertising. Um, there are several patient considerations to consider, including uh, products that are available, access to those products and supply. Um, you should consider hemp policies and their potential interplay with adult use. Other states have legalized adult use and have lessons learned. And I believe Michelle's working to make sure that you will hear from some of those regulators, but each state has their own unique population and needs. And so um, I would encourage you all to take a Hawaii specific approach to protect consumer safety, to prevent youth access, to promote equity and to create an adult use market. Um, just because another state has done something does not mean that you should copy and paste that in Hawaii. You have a very different context here and some unique considerations. So I just blew through that because of time. <laughs> um, I hope it was helpful. All for inviting me here in person. It really made a difference back in the past few shows. And this is where we're going to entertain questions from the task force. And I'm going to I'm going to do it a little differently this time. I'm going to ask the task force members who are appearing virtually first. I'm going to give them an opportunity ask them questions. So can you get up there? We've got, uh, I've got down uh, Barrett Otani, Joanne Taguchi, Dr. Ireland, Ellen Shane, Representative Imani, Tolan, Foreman. Any of you have any questions for uh, Julia? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so I know that you have Someone have a question? Uh, yes, this is Ellen Ching. Are we going to be able to get a copy of your presentation? Yes. yes. Perfect. That's all I need. Thank you. And and there's also an article. Oh, do I need to mute myself? <laughs> there's also an article that um that I published uh, that I believe the task force has access to as well. It's now a year and a half dated, but it reviews the policy across US states. Um, so it's similar to my presentation. And after, 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 and after we have time to kind of look through your presentation more and think about it, are we able to communicate with you and provide you with questions about your presentation? I'm looking at our attorney general, the attorney general, he says, yes, you are. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, provided that you meet the sunshine laws, I'm happy to um, be a resource to help connect you with other states that might be a resource. Um, that's what we do at the Cannabis Regulators Association. So happy to serve in any ways that are useful to the task force. Great. Thank you. Any other task force members who are doing virtually that have questions? Hearing none, a task with members who are here in person. Questions for Jim. This is your opportunity. Thank you very much for thank you very much for your presentation. 
Um, one thing I wanted to, to ask about was uh, uniformity in regulation within a state, particularly amongst you know counties. I know that California, which I was just in a few weeks ago, is it's a patchwork. Uh, the fifth largest city in the state, Fresno, has zero cannabis dispensaries. So you have to go 35 miles away to Tulare and more to, to obtain you know, legal cannabis products. Um, and so what states have done a good job in promoting uniformity and regulations across county lines? And also what, what states have done a good job of taking some of the tax revenues that come from adult use sales and channeling it to uh, under-resourced rural communities, um, whether it's education, health, or you know the myriad other needs we have. Well, all of our neighbor islands here are under-resourced, and they need uh, more tax revenue to, to fund services and programs. Yeah, great question. So first, I would say that California is a bit of an outlier in terms of how much local control they've given. Typically what we see from states in, in local control is they have control over time, place, manner. Um, there are a handful of states that have given local control to opt out, but that creates a challenge, especially in addressing the illicit market um, and, and also potentially for impaired driving, right? Because you're going to a different county to purchase products and bring back to your county. So I think the norm is that, and you'll, you'll hear this again from the panel of regulators that Michelle's gonna be bringing before you, the norm is that localities have authority over time, place, manner, and any codes that exist locally. Um, in terms of tax revenue, there, you know, California, obviously, because they are so localized in the approach that they've taken, uh, their counties do receive a big chunk of tax revenue because they are also regulating it at the county level. Um, New Jersey, I believe, allowed, um, allowed counties that opted in to add a tax, like a 2% tax to the product, and then they, they are able to keep that tax revenue. Um, I'm just looking at my um, local government. So California, Illinois, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico all have some of their tax revenue going to local government. And I don't have my, my detailed policy notes in front of me, but there will be different ap approaches. You know, Some of them may just get it. Some of them may get it if they opt in. Um, some of them may get it by adding a tax. I think those are the different ways. Other questions for Julia? Here, yeah. Uh, Julia, you, you mentioned that there were 20 states that already have pending legislation uh, that's been legalized marijuana for recreational use. Or something. I don't. What are your slides? Yeah, I, I didn't, those are the states that have already legalized adult use. It's a, it's the time, sort of the table, this timetable. Right. Yeah. So those are the states that have already legalized so, adult so what's, use. What's the trend? Uh, at the end of the day, say five years from now, if all 50 states have some kind of legislation that legalizes recreation and use of marijuana. I think we generally see states move through a trajectory. That trajectory has changed a little bit, though. We've had we've had states that have jumped from having nothing to legalizing full adult use. But the norm is that there's a medical program, and then that medical program is built on, and adult use is sort of added to it. Um, I think every state's moving at their own pace, and and in part because of the Schedule One designation, we do see this state by state approach um, that's created different policies in every state. Um, I'm often, often asked, is there one state that I would hold up as being the best state, in my opinion? And there isn't. I think there are pieces of different programs in states that are good for different reasons. But I think every state regulator would tell you themselves that they haven't necessarily gotten it right. And it's not a matter of not knowing what might improve a program. Um, many of the changes to these programs would require legislation. It can be very long. There are lots of interests that come into legislation. Um, so I think when you talk to regulators, they'll probably be very candid in telling you that there are a lot of challenges in implementing the programs that the way they think would best, again, so protect consumer safety, promote equity, you know. So is there an organization that's working on the uniform law? Um, that's one of the things that that CANRA will be doing over time is focusing on sort of best practices. But I, I think that's that's very challenging. And the best practices that we have in a lot of areas are still sort of pie in the sky because the legislative process, um, you know, has to be implemented to make changes. In some cases, states have statutes that came out of ballot measures um, that may not reflect the reality that we're in now. And, and my last question is, is this part of this task force to Michelle can comment on that. I believe you're focused on, on the state. Um, Michelle? There's a whole federal landscape happening yes. in the background. Yes, correct. It's it's we're focused on 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 state 
legalization. And if people couldn't hear, Michelle just confirmed that the focus of this task force is on state legalization in Hawaii. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Other questions for you? Yes, please. Uh, doctor, off the top of your head, could you suggest to the task force perhaps two or three key issues that we should begin to investigate? Yeah, I think, um, you know, channeling our members, I think most regulators would tell you that in their regulatory purview, they are trying to protect consumer safety, they are trying to promote equity, and they are trying to create predictability for a viable marketplace. And those three issues do not always go hand in hand. But I think those are the themes that that um, state regulators are most focused on uh, today. And those themes are very different than, again, what state regulators in Washington and Colorado were focused on 10 years ago. Excuse me. Um, this is Ellen Chang on video. Um, I cannot hear the people that are asking the questions. So if the Department of Health moderator would repeat the question, that would be helpful. That people could access for drug information. Um, do you know of any efforts to collect information about like drug, drug interactions or other harmful effects of yeah so wendy just asked for people who couldn't hear do i know anything about uh, drug information websites or any resources for collecting information around drug drug interactions so the states that have required um, something on their package it's typically either a poison control center phone number that tends to be the the line that people call when a child accidentally consumes a product or when they have an adverse reaction they call the poison control center um or increasingly there's discussion about some website people could go to report adverse events. We know that FDA is very interested in, in monitoring adverse events from cannabis products to better understand, um, but there's not a single, you know, non-biased, non-partisan resource that I would suggest that is, is monitoring this. We certainly have an opportunity to do a much better job in understanding adverse events, how they may be pre preventable, which consumers are experiencing them, which products may come from them. Um, but that's something that you want to consider in your own state how you know how packaging might drive people to poison control does poison control get additional funding to sort of monitor what's the feedback loop for for data so you can make sure consumers have access to safe products thanks wendy any other questions for julian okay julian thanks again thank so you valuable. for waiting for me I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you Oh, oh, okay. You know what? You gotta earn your money. We have one more question. Yeah. Uh, uh, Otani, a task member Otani has a question. Hi, can, uh, can you hear me? Are you there? Hello, can you hear yeah. me? Yes. Yes. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is um, regarding um, you know, states like Portland or Seattle, when who have adopted like the uh, I guess they were a template for the Vision Zero policy of zero uh, uh, eliminate all tra traffic fatalities. Uh, has there been any studies collect, uh, connecting that to cannabis use? And whatnot in the Pacific Northwest uh, Vision Zero uh, collaborations or what? Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm hearing too much of myself. I hope you're not. Um, okay. I think you're talking. I think you're talking. Is it okay now? No. Testing. Testing. Um, um, should I plug my ears and talk or? Oh, that's better. Okay, I think you're talking about um, traffic safety. And I, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know about the Vision Zero program, but I can tell you some of the challenges on the traffic safety side that regulators and, and state agencies have faced. Um, one is that the data sources around impaired driving and cannabis are very limited. 
Um, there are all sorts of challenges to actually detecting if marijuana was on board. Um, we know that, that different uh, consumers may respond differently to cannabis. It is fat soluble. It can stay in the body for a long time. So most of what states do with the legislative process is um, allocate funding for public safety. That funding is typically for increased uh, A-RIDE and DRE officers. Those are officers that can um, do drug detection at, at the roadside um, using you know, systems that do not involve bodily fluids because we don't have a blood or a saliva test that is reliable at this juncture for detecting impaired driving. But there are a lot of challenges to that. And again, happy to connect the task force with some of the folks we have at CANRA, an impaired, uh, impaired driving and traffic safety committee. I'm happy to connect you with some of the folks um, working on this. Our committee in CANRA on that topic is actually co-chaired by the current president of the Governor's Highway Traffic Safety uh, Association. So um, happy to put you in touch with folks that know a lot more about this topic than I do. Thank you, Julie. Now you're done. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, before I turn it back over to Shaw, I think one of the actually had came today and Yeah. Sorry. Actually, there was a question related. Over to Michelle, I was going to uh, finish. Um, over what is this actually? Uh, uh, federal again, I hope everybody can okay. hear me okay. Uh, I just wanted to to thank everybody for sticking with us. Um, because we uh, ran long, uh, rather there was one additional agenda item that we were planning to cover tonight today. Um, but what we're going to do is, is move that to next month's agenda, and that would be the um, discussion regarding identification of key cannabis issues for um, further investigation. So I will ask all of the... No, nah, wait, members, hold on. You can't just skip over that. That's the most important uh, part take, of that. Take this time over the next month to consider some of the information that Jillian provided to us um, and think about... Uh, the, your perspective, you know, your role um, and, and uh, the subject matter that you represent on this task force and, and come prepared uh, next month to identify those specific policy issues that this task force should focus our work on. Um, you know, there, there's a lot, as you can see from Jillian's uh, presentation, there is, a, you know, a lot to be covered. Um, and we want to make sure that um, we identify at least the priorities. You know, it, it doesn't mean that um, we, we can cover everything that we would like to be able to cover, but, you know, at least if we can get started um, on a few priorities. Um, the other thing that I will be asking for is uh, for task force members to uh, take assignments uh, related to particular policy issues, um, you know, and, and be the lead on, on uh, a work group to further research that particular subject, you know, and then um, and bring that information back to the task force in the future. Other than that, um, I do want to thank everybody for sticking with us through all our technical issues. Uh, we will get better, I promise. Thank you very much. Meeting. Next meeting. Oh, sorry, you. next meeting is on May 23rd. Uh, and uh, it begins at 12 noon again. Uh, and with that, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.